Uh, welcome everybody, uh, whether in, in S5 or on online. Uh, I'm Yussi Hanhimeki. I am um, the current head of the Department of International History and Politics here at the Graduate Institute. And this is one of our uh, one part in our series of success stories um, that uncovered uh, in, in which we meet our alumni of the Institute. And today we are meeting in particular alumni of the International History and Politics Department. Um, and today's focus will be on three exceptional individuals who, um, who I know very well myself uh, from, from years past um, and who all uh, completed actually a PhD here at the Graduate Institute over the last, um, between 2014 and 2017. So the three are, I'm going to pass this on to, on to them. The idea is that they can they will go around and, and all three will tell us a little bit about their um, experience, uh, both, um, you know, why they did their PhDs here in the first place and then how their career um, uh, evolved from there. Uh, but maybe I just quickly introduced uh, the three panelists today. We have uh, Jackie Eisenberg, who is joining us. She is not too far from where we are now. She is currently at the World Economic Forum. Jackie is holds both a master and a PhD from the Graduate Institute, uh, and her PhD was from uh, from 2014. Jackie is currently the head of Transformation uh, Forum Foundations at the World Economic Forum, so WF, so just across the lake uh, from from where we are now. Um, then we have Se Yun uh, Yang, who is uh, also PhD from 2017 from the International History and Politics Department. Uh, Se Yun is currently a senior research fellow <coughs> at the University of Vienna, but she has uh, quite a few steps on her career, both before coming to the institute and then afterwards. And she'll be she'll be telling us quite a bit about that in a moment. I just wanted to. Um, but well, I happen to have in my office Se Jung's PhD thesis uh, from 2017, since I happen to be the director of the of the thesis. So I'll flash that uh, that now. And then, of course, we have Luca Lamort, who is who is Lamorte. Is that correct, Luca? Thank you. Who is joining us from not quite next door? Um, Se Jung is in Vienna, and Luca is in uh, Hanoi, Vietnam. So the time difference is, is is a few hours. It must be must be uh, early evening or, or something like that in Hanoi at the moment. Luca is uh, is also a PhD from the Department uh, of International History and Politics, 2017, and his current position is a communication specialist at the Asian Development Bank that is based in Manila, Manila, the Philippines. Uh, I ha also somehow happen to have Lucas PhD thesis on my shelf, so that's this one. Uh, and look, I happen to be his his PhD director as well. So you see, there's some connection, um, some connection here already going on. So anyway, what I thought we'd do today, we have uh, <clears throat> we have uh, plenty of time, I think, till uh, till about two o'clock uh, local time. So uh, we don't have to go all the way there, but that's that's where where we can keep keep this going with questions and and so forth emerge. But I thought we'd just go give a, let let Jackie and Se Jung and Luca say a few words first about how they, you know, how their life has evolved uh, and, and how the, you know, about the different challenges and of course their successes uh, and how what the role perhaps the Graduate Institute and your education here played in 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 helping you move ahead with your with your career so why don't we, we start with jackie and then go to say jung and and luca afterwards so jackie it's uh on to you thank you you see and thank you uh katarina and karine for the invitation as well um nice to meet everybody so i'll tell you a bit about myself and then a few takeaways from my experience doing the phd at the institute so my name is Jackie Eisenberg, and as UC mentioned, I work at the World Economic Forum today. I initially came to the Institute almost 20 years ago <laughs> when I was studying abroad as an undergraduate. Um, and I had the privilege of taking a few classes both at the University of Geneva and also at what was at the time, Ashi. Uh, UC, I think I even had a survey on uh, 
a big survey course that was over the old cafeteria with you back in the day. <laughs> um, and basically, when I came abroad, I fell in love with the Graduate Institute, I fell in love with Geneva, and also the archives here. Um, while I was studying abroad as an undergraduate, I interned and volunteered at a number of organizations, including the International Labor Office, Médecins Sans Frontières, also the Geneva Art and History Museum. And I really discovered that I liked international organizations, both from the way they operate, but also from the great archives that they have. Um, so when I finished my bachelor's degree back in the US, I actually decided to come back and work for the ILO for a bit. Um, I worked in their archives for about a year while I was applying to grad school. At the time, I didn't really know if I wanted to pursue that in the US or if I wanted to pursue that in the UK or even Switzerland. And when I looked at everything, I said, you know, Switzerland makes a lot of sense, both from where my intellectual interests are with the international organizations. Um, I was also very lucky to have a great uh, scholarship package from the Institute, uh, both for my master's and my PhD, which made the choice quite easy. Um, and while I was here, I sort of continued what I've been doing on that year abroad. So experiencing working in organizations as well. Um, I did some contracting work for the ILO's Century Project, which was running up to the centenary up to 2019. Um, I worked with UC and Jerome Ellie on a project on UNHCR. Um, I taught a little bit at the Smith Program in Geneva, which is the study abroad program that brought me to Geneva. Um, and this is where I probably pivot maybe from the other panelists. Um, as I was getting to the end of my PhD, I realized that I actually really didn't like teaching. It wasn't something that I envisioned doing for the rest of my life. It didn't you know, get me out of bed in the morning. What I liked more was research and inquiry. Um, so I knew that I had to pivot out of academia pretty quickly because it didn't seem like something that was going to make me happy in the long term. Um, so in order to find what I wanted to do and where I wanted to work, I connected with a lot of friends that were working in organizations that interested me here in Geneva. Um, I also connected with alumni through the help of the alumni network at the Institute and just talk to people, you know, what were they doing? What did they study? How did their studies help them find their job? What did their day-to-day -day look like? What challenges did they face? What did they like about the organizations? And after about those 20 conversations, I had a good idea of about two organizations I really wanted to work at in Geneva, and one was the forum. Um, that being said, it was not a linear path. Um, I think after the PhD, over more than a year, I applied to 70 jobs, and I, at the end, I had to take two sort of temporary jobs when I look back on it. One was at the Institute, one was at the World Trade Organization. So I would mention that just by way of you might not land where you will land permanently straight away. You might have to sort of be open, try new experiences and see where they take you. Um, but towards the end of that second sort of shorter position with the WTO, um, I had three offers and one was at the forum, which again was one of these organizations that I was quite interested to work for. Um, without going into too much at this moment, what I do at the forum, so there's time for the other presentation, uh, other panelists to talk about their trajectory, just a few takeaways that I'll throw out at the top. Um, I think what I gathered from the PhD that I brought into my future career were four things. Uh, one is perseverance. Um, you know, if you're working on a master's thesis or a PhD thesis, you really have to make sure that you're keeping it moving forward on your own. At the end of the day, you're really the only one who cares about it. Your advisor cares about it, but your advisor cares about his other advisees or her other advisees as well. So you really have to make sure that you're in the darkness of the fourth year when you're not sure if your funding is going to be renewed, that you're plugging forward. And that's actually a very good quality, uh, particularly when you're in the, the private sector, the public sector as well. Um, project management, I hope you all realize as you do a master's or a PhD, this is really an exceptional opportunity to develop and prove your project management skills. You're dealing with budget, with grant funding for research, particularly to go visit archives. Um, you have a really complex shifting timeline. You have moments where you have to present your research that might not be fully baked. Um, all of that is great and will serve you well on the job market. Also, we're great communicators in history. We have to learn how to express complex ideas very concisely and with nuance. Um, the one caveat I would add is that I found on the, ex the outside, you really have to be quite synthetic in what you say. Um, People don't want to read long emails or long memos. You really have to go to the essence. So it does take a little bit of a moment to um, think about how you can winnow that down. But definitely the communication skills you've built up through your master's, through your PhD will help you. 
Um, and then the last thing was, I think, particular to the Institute, because I don't know if it's the same in other schools, but um, by virtue of its proximity to International Geneva, at least when I was there, we were encouraged to sort of explore options for internships, for research projects um, with other organizations. And I think that variety of experience really served me well. Uh, when I reflect on the diversity of roles I've had in the forum, I've really never done just one thing. I'm always working on multiple topics at once. Um, and I think the PhD and the master's and that experience, both doing the studies and working on the side really brought me forward in that way. So I'll leave it there for now. Hand back to UC. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. I mean, we'll come back to you, I'm, I'm sure, uh, a few times uh, going forward today. Uh, but it's 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 great that you 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 could share all this experience, and I think some of the things you just said about uh, what the type of skills that that indeed you can gain from a a, a degree, whether a master's or or a PhD at the, at the Graduate Institute in International History and Politics, really are the type of skills that are much in demand in uh, well in International Geneva. You are part of that, but of course also in the wider world, and I think. That's uh, where it's a good moment maybe to turn to say Jung, who's had a different, different path um, in terms of, of of her career. So say Jung, uh, on to you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me uh, for this wonderful event. I'm really kind of I can say I'm so pleased to be reconnected with uh, the great institute. And when I offer this opportunity to talk, I was thinking what. Can I really tell you know the students? Uh, my experiences would be somewhat different from the others, especially when I joined the institute. I was I think I was the oldest during my cohort because I already had my work experiences in Korea. I was also was doing my PhD in Korea in international relations. So and maybe you already saw, you know, from the biography, I was already the South Korean diplomat before I joined, I joined the, the Graduate Institute. So I was already working on nuclear issues. You know, I wrote my dissertation about nuclear history between South Korea and the United States. So I already knew <laughs> yeah, that this field, you know, at least a little bit in the practical field. So I was working for this field and then I kind of had to make a decision, kind of my life decision because of my kind of personal circumstances because I met my boyfriend and now he's my husband, but he is Swiss. So, I mean, maintaining this kind of long distance relationship was not easy. So I decided to kind of quit my job and then started my PhD again. Uh, so I just uh, was searching, you know, what kind of school exists in Switzerland. And then I found the Great Institute and I heard, you know, very good kind of stories about this school. So I just uh, applied for this one this one institute. I didn't apply for any other university. So I applied for the institute and I was very lucky to be accepted. So, so I started my PhD in, uh, in Geneva and I was already a PhD student in international relations, but I switched to international history because uh, working um, as a diplomat, I was the one who kind of produced lots of diplomatic documents. And then I realized that the importance of these kind of diplomatic documents, I mean, everyone, I mean, historians know that it's important, but for more general public, you know, usually this history is somewhat, you know, they regard it, this is not that important and they are not that well educated about the importance of this kind of historical development. So I decided to be a diplomatic historian from the very beginning of my PhD program and then I was really kind of uh how can I say just focused on this nuclear history from the first year. So from the first year I applied for a summer kind of school in international nuclear history where I met lots of friends and colleagues for my like academic life. 
I mean, from I mean, since then, I really maintained this academic network with this fellow nuclear historian. So it was my first year as a PhD student. So, and then, so I, I wanna, I wanted to actually advise you to start this kind of networking as early as possible. Um, staying at the institute and learning and studying is important, but also, you know, joining some conferences, summer school, workshop, whatever, it's a good way to extend your academic network, which will be very useful in your later academic career. So, and then in my third year, I moved to the United States. Uh, I got this fellowship, Albert Gallatin Fellowship, offered by the Institute. Still, do you have this fellowship program? Oh yeah, that's great, yes. So I got this fellowship and then for third year, I went to the George Washington University and then with that money, which I was really grateful, I was able to start my archival research in the United States. So visited National Archive, visited several presidential libraries, things like that. So it was really useful. Also, I got other grants from the Institute. So I was able to travel to France, Germany, and Korea to you know, continue my archival research. And then after that, you know, I, also, um, probably apply for lots of pre-doctoral, also post-doctoral fellowship afterwards. Because from the third year, I stayed in the United States. I was not in Geneva, so I was away, and I wanted to be more involved in those academic communities, you know, outside Switzerland. So I was at the fellows at Harvard Kennedy School, Belfast Center, and later also I joined the MIT as a, a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow. Also, I applied for some non-resident fellow position here and there. So I was able to continue, how can I say this, uh, uh, those, uh, the lines on my CV, <laughs> but which it's quite useful later when you apply for any kind of job. Because if you just stay in your university or department, and then you, if you don't have many other more external experiences, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't really impress, you know, those uh, searching committee. I was also at the searching committee several times in Leiden University and other universities. So when I read old CVs, this kind of different kinds of fellow experiences would be quite important to impress your future employer. So, yeah, and then, so after my postdoc fellowship at MIT, I was able to come back to Europe as an assistant professor at Leiden University. So I taught there for four years, and then even I got a tenure, but I had to leave uh, due to my personal circumstances. Uh, so now I'm in Vienna. And then I also applied for those EU uh, Marie Curie Fellowship, and I was very lucky to get this one as well. So I'm very happy to be here and continue my research and then working on this nuclear history between Korea and the IAEA in the, in the coming years. And, and one, one last thing I wanna just talk is, I mean, probably I was a bit, in a different situation from other uh, other PhD students because I was already pregnant and gave birth to my son before I defended my dissertation. So all this last year as a PhD student was not easy, definitely. But anyway, you know, I can manage to finish this. And if you, some of you have any questions more this kind of personal circumstance in how to deal with this, I would be happy to answer later. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Se-Yung. It's, uh, it's, of course, great to see you. It, it's, it's, it's quite the journey as you were describing it, um, both before and after, after your PhD. And, and, and so, you know, Success Stories Uncovered is, is a perfectly, it's, it's an absolutely perfect title for, for this series, as we've already, already learned. And it's, uh, you know, 
the pathways are very different and we now have two examples and we will hear from Luca as a third different pathway uh, in, in terms of career and, and so forth. So Luca, I pass it on to you. Um, and Luca, as I said before, is uh, uh, like the Jung, received his PhD in 2017 here from the Institute. So Luca. All right. Thanks, Jussi. Thanks, everyone. And uh, good evening from uh, Southeast Asia. So my story is also very different from the previous two. Um, I, on one side, um, sort of always worked during my bachelor and master's degree. I was always in advertising agencies or multimedia production, but I also had a fond love for, uh, for history and I really wanted to work with, uh, with UC. And at the same time, um, when I was finishing my master's degree, I started considering whether to pursue my PhD in a city that would only open up to uh, positions in academia. So London, New York, um, DC, um, Paris, or whether I wanted to position myself in a way that would allow me to keep both options open because I knew I loved history on one side, but I also knew that I wanted to work for uh, an international organization and Geneva seemed the best, uh, the best option. I was admitted uh, to other PhDs in London and in the US, but eventually decided to go for Geneva. And I think that was probably the wisest choice among the ones I had, because soon after I moved to Geneva, I started taking on positions, consultancies or internships for several organizations, still within the realm of communication, which which I think historians are perfectly fit for. Uh, we have very unique, a very unique understanding of, uh, of uh, the world that surrounds us and the past, uh, not to mention having witnessed all of the terrible things that humans have done to each other. We, we tend to have a, an interesting sense of humor, which applies really well to, to communications department, allows us to really gather information and package them in a, in a short and concise manner. I don't think other departments have the same, uh, the same structure. I'm not mentioning, not questioning whether other people can, I'm sure other people in other departments can develop the same, but I think historians are a unique position and some strategic advantage, especially in, in uh, let's say strategic communication and also I would say policymakers as a whole. So I started working, uh, uh, in parallel with my PhD and I was lucky enough in my last two years to land on a position at the Kofi Annan Foundation working for um, the former UNSG Kofi Annan and managing his personal social media accounts which at the time were probably among the largest in uh, within the UN uh, sector and that was a very formative experience also having you know, the privilege of sharing uh, as a historian, you know, basically being in touch with history itself as a man who was, who had sort of tried to redefine the UN and, you know, fought, found himself fighting really hard against the Americans and, uh, and others during the re-election and, uh, you know, all the interesting things that happened during the, the war in Iraq. So it was an interesting experience live, witnessing the man in action and learning, absorbing like a sponge from him and, and having the privilege to work with, uh, with his team. And then towards the end of my PhD, I was again very lucky to be headhunted by the um, UN Migration Agency, IOM, um, who was at the time transitioning to become part of the UN as a non-related organization. And they were badly, they were needed. They, ne they needed to find somebody to, to handle the um, their corporate social media and uh, Mr. Anan, Mr. Anan was uh, was very happy to to recommend me because the former head of IOM, Ambassador Williams Wing, who unfortunately died unfortunately died a few years ago, had been appointed by Mr. Anan as the head of UN peacekeepers in Congo when Mr. Anan was the UNSG. But all these series of circumstances helped me land that position. Um, and then again, after you know a, a very interesting journey of uh, six years and a half, I was again headhunted 
uh, right in the middle of COVID by the Asian Development Bank, who was who is now undergoing, who is um, not really within the realm of the UN agencies as part of IFIs, multilateral development uh, banks, similar to the World Bank, but focused on Asia and the Pacific. Um, a very interesting mandate and over nearly 70 countries as member states and a completely different uh, 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 beast, let's say. A lot more high level, a lot more political than the UN because there is a lot more money involved and sort of required me uh, required me to not U-turn, but go 180 in terms of what I had understood so far about diplomacy and sort of reinvent myself again for the past three years. But it's been so far a wonderful experience. I'm learning a lot. And uh, yeah, it's a different job from the one I had in Geneva, but very, very interesting. And I'm again seeing international development in action. And to me, uh, the experience in Geneva was pivotal in several ways. First, as again, as I said, the working with UC was a great experience in itself, one of the best Cold War historians alive, and I was a great fond of his work in 1970s as a whole. Uh, of course, the network of, the network of other students, with many of which I'm, I'm, I'm still in touch with and uh, with whom I've shared a lot of, lot of uh, long uh, friendships to this point, uh, and those are always useful as we progress in our careers. And then the fact that I was based in Geneva. Geneva gave me uh, five years during my PhD to expand my network, do experience, learn what I wanted to do, learn what I didn't want to do. But having that opportunity to be at the center of international diplomacy, I would say no other city would, would have given me the same opportunity. I know many other colleagues who landed on United Nations roles or even from LSE or Sciences Po or others. But I think what they lacked was that the, 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 the fact that we were there, we could do things throughout the academic year that they couldn't do unless they were here in Geneva for a summer course or a summer internship. So we had a strategic advantage. By the time I finished my PhD, I was already a few years ahead of them. And now down, you know, down the line in my career, I'm noticing that how that Ex that whole experience was was in itself immensely uh, strategic and and I benefited a lot from uh, not just the Institute but from Geneva as a whole and breathing that sort of history in the making that uh, I would say only a few cities in the world would give you the opportunity to do and if I just leave you with something um, you know in terms of per perseverance uh, I know pursuing a PhD is hard um, um, I myself had to take a fifth year um, because at the end of my third year, I had to face two things. First, a near-death experience in Brazil during my archive research that nearly killed me, um, developed a septic infection, terrible experience. And then when I came back, just after a couple of months, my entire PhD research was stolen. Uh, my my hard drive, my, my Mac, my everything was stolen. And um, I had to basically start from scratch at the end of my third year, while I was working for Mr. Anand, and I had to take an extra year to finish. And in those two years were extremely complicated from, uh, from uh, emotional, psychological, and also in terms of workload, because it was basically a nonstop experience, working during the day, working on the PhD at night, and basically seven days a week. Uh, but I, I did learn a lot through those two years, and. Again, if you can, once you finish the experience, uh, going back to what just Jackie said at the beginning, in terms of perseverance, when you look back at what you have accomplished, it's a long project. You don't see the benefits during the PhD. Often you get discouraged. We get ups and down. We see others maybe starting their corporate career and us still studying. But again, remember that career is not a sprint. Career, whether it's in academia or in, um, in a corporate world, whether it's the UN, or the private sector is a marathon and what you accomplish has a 30 to 40 years career span so don't be discouraged look at the vast amount of opportunities that you have in geneva and elsewhere and make advantage of the incredible network that the institute your professors your peers have and treasure these moments because one day you'll be looking back with uh, with some a mix of nostalgia and uh, 
and also admiration for what you accomplished and for what you will accomplish in the future. I'll, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Luca. Thank you so much. Uh, and and um, I, I think you know, of all three of you, you've had a, a different uh, experience, obviously, in terms of your your where you came from, for to to Geneva, to the Graduate Institute, um, your career path since, uh, during, and since uh, since then. Um, I think I've had the I had the, the the honor and so forth to to be there when you were students and and it's it's great to see how <laughs> how you have moved on and and how successful you all, all three of you are, are today um it's uh, the last thing that that Luca that you were saying in terms of um of the graduate institute and and the connections i think this is where i just wanted to uh, point out that this is an event organized by the alumni uh, office of the, of the of the graduate institute which is which is the greatest uh, resource for um, you know networking with people like you so to speak in a, in, a, in a sense people who had these similar experiences and as we know um, this is not just anecdotal three anecdotal examples of of careers that uh, that span the world as we can see, uh, you're all in different parts of the world, um, but also go into different directions in terms of uh, of, of uh, whether with international organizations, whether in, in, in the academia, whether in in, uh, in the fields like um, uh, media, communications, uh, etc., etc. And these are a few examples uh, uh, that, and of course, diplomacy, uh, which is an, uh, an important um, avenue career uh, path for many of our many of our graduates so thank you so much for 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 sharing um, um some of your experience i know that there's much more to be said about this i think at the moment um let me i, I just wanted to also thank for thank uh, katarina and uh and karin for for making this this happen um and and uh, and so forth it's uh, it's a great opportunity i think for also for some uh, questions and answers from from those who are in a position that some of you, that you three were some time ago and perhaps are wondering what might happen next um and and uh you know uh so i wonder if there's anybody either in in s5 in the room who might wish to pose a question or somebody some of our we have a few uh few attendees online as well so uh, I would just like to open this, this for any questions, comments, and so forth. Yeah, we, we have a question here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jessica. Um, let me start by thanking you guys for talking about your career parts. It's actually very enlightening, uh, specifically for me, because I think I also want to work as a communication specialist or something like that. But um, <clears throat> I wanted to just ask, most times when I apply or when I see um, jobs with international organizations, they usually just put um, international relations, international law. You hardly ever see, you know, when they're like requesting for your specification, like in your master's um, degree, what you specified in, you never really see international history there. I just always wonder, like, <laughs> how did you guys manage that? Was it something you struggled with? I don't know. Do you have any insights or something? Yeah. Um, so, maybe I can, I, can, I can take a quick answer. So um, for me, I never saw the absence of history as limiting. Um, I think, I don't know if it's still the case, so you see, you'll have to let me know, but midway through the, I think the PhD, they changed it from international history and politics it was like to international studies with a specialization in history so there's already that linguistic flip that gives you a legitimate opening but um i see now sort of being on the other side of the hiring table recruiting people that um generally it seems like hiring managers put that because it's the shortest path but they do recognize there are other candidates that might be good i think where it's it's more important is that um, where I've seen people sort of struggle a bit is that when they don't have the imagination to go beyond 
how what they've done actually can be transferable. You know, if you come in and you say, I have a PhD, many people are going to say, great, you were in school for too long. <laughs> if you come in and you say, you know, I managed this amazing project, I found grants, you know, I solicited grants, I followed up on the monitoring, it's a different way of framing what you do. So I don't see it as limiting. I think it just involves a little bit of massaging. Massaging is not even the right word. It just involves presenting your experience differently. Yeah, and on top of that, um, I, most people don't really care about what you're studying comms. They care about what you can do. And communication, as you know, is not just writing a press release. Communication ranges from digital to strategic communication to video production to social media to anything. You have to be as specific as you can be and try to really see where your skills come, come in handy and where your skills matched with your studies in history come in handy. Um, if you just say you want to work in communication, I wouldn't know from what you just said what kind of role you see yourself in. Um, so definitely try to expand the, the things you can do besides wanting to be a communication specialist and going into interviews with specific skills will, will help you land the position. But I don't think, frankly, I don't care what you study. You can, you can study, you, you don't even need a, a degree in the humanities to work in communication. You need specific set of personal skills. You need to be a very good writer. And that's something that you can also flex. Although I have to be careful that as, as an academia, as a writing academia, you will have to unlearn a few things if you want to work in communication. Not in the way you think. In the way you think, you can be as strategic and and uh, comprehensive as you as you want and can be. But you will have to sort of learn to navigate the politics, which, as a historian, you should be able to because that's what you study. As well as write, sort of unlearn how to write in academia and write in a completely different way. But it's doable. I know lots of communications professionals with degrees in history, PhD in history, and even head of departments of communications with degrees in history. So it's perfectly doable. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just maybe to, to, to add to that, I, I think, Jessica, what you're asking, uh, what, what you asked, of course, is something that um, is preying upon our minds at, at the Graduate Institute every now and then in the in the in the in the international history and politics department, and which is why what what we are doing actually is is increasingly got, you know already have done a little bit, but I'm moving towards which is introducing a certain number of courses in the future that that emphasize peculiar skills, as 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 Luca was was saying in terms of. Uh, of of writing, um, um, I don't know policy papers, and in, in terms of writing, um, well, communal strategic communications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So more that that I would, I guess, would be called uh, applied history rather than sort of pure history. In 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 an effort to try to sort of help our students um, in the master's level, in, in particular, to to sort of bridge the gap from what is. The scholarly world, which has certain conventions, especially when it comes to writing, like like Luca was saying, and then what we sometimes call the real world, which is the world in which uh, which most communication actually does take place in in and and so forth. So that is that is one thing that that we're doing. We also wish to emphasize that the other side, which is that historians make, in our understanding, make better communicators, make better writers, make better diplomats make better almost anything and that's just um you know it's not just selfish bragging about my discipline but i think it's it's a um a proven fact in a sense that we we learn important skills that are very transferable but are not limiting in a sense that uh, they um they would paint you in a corner that you can only do X. I think what what history allows you is is in a sense to to break away from a very narrow career path, in, and 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 helps and, and allows you to 
to develop your own in a much more efficient, uh, efficient uh, and open manner than uh, than maybe some other other disciplines that are perhaps a little bit more trade oriented, if you will, in in that sense. But yeah, I think uh, we we hear the uh, the challenge, and I think some of the other things, Jessica, I think, but are important. I think in in terms of of if you are indeed not looking for a traditional academic path is of course then to make use of all the other opportunities that we've been that our three panelists have already discussed what, what geneva offers which is the internships the opportunities in different organizations to gain experience that that will uh, will help you build your career uh, in a sense okay uh, i think we have a question from um uh, well, Karin, yes, to everyone. Jackie, uh, it's about a working permit. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, um, that? that was a funny odyssey. So I'm from the US. Um, when I studied abroad, I had a student permit. Um, when I worked at the UN, I had a carte de legitimation. It's kind of the diplomatic permit that you, you kind of exist, but not really. <laughs> um, so long story short, I actually naturalized um, under the old regime. Um, which unfortunately, I guess, is not in place based on the pure number of years. Um, I, I kind of was able to write as that was closing. So that is unfortunately not a, a great venue for future students. Um, I do remember that that was something that weighed on me for several years. And I tried to explore options with the administration at the Institute. Um, received very unhelpful advice, like marry your boyfriend who lives in France. Um, so <laughs> at the end of the day, really, you know, just had to keep persevering. Um, I, many international organizations are able to get you um, are able to get you sort of the diplomatic permits, but it doesn't allow you towards permanent residency. So unfortunately, for third country nationals like those from the US, um, unless your employer is willing to go to bat, it, it, it doesn't really provide you a longer term perspective. Yeah, that's very true, because I spent 12 years in Geneva, and I have nothing after I left precisely because I'm part of the new regulations. Yeah. Yeah. You are Italian, Luca. Sorry? You are Italian. Yes, but I couldn't get any naturalization. And I spent more than 10 years in the country. But because of new regulations and because I had a CDL, like Jackie says, I existed but did not exist at the same time. So by the time I transferred abroad i lost a lot of my well if i go back to geneva i will have to start from zero in terms of bureaucracy which that's part of the new rules but it's the way it is it's okay so now we are talking about are we discussing the sort of naturalization process how to become swiss in effect how, how to have access to the swiss job market or the, right. the job market in geneva um much better yeah right yeah. right um if I, still... oh, go ahead i have a different thought based on something you guys said earlier no no, no. it's just that if you're if you are european and it, it, you you have or swiss you'll have a strategic advantage against third third party nationals including americans because of the system you you know very well I actually, Luca, I found something you said really interesting about being headhunted for your role and actually maybe wanted to open up, if I can, <laughs> a bit of a discussion with you and uh, Se Young. Um, I think one thing I found was that at a certain point, I, um, Jessica, you had mentioned sort of applying for jobs. At a certain point, you find out that there are many jobs that are actually never posted. People come to you because they know you, they know your reputation. Uh, can happen earlier or later. Um, the short-term role I mentioned at the WTO, um, I had done a collaboration with them back when I worked at the ILO, and one of the counterparts there remembered me. And as I was looking for a job, I sort of reached out to everybody in my network saying, next few months, do you have anything? And a few months later, he came back to me and said, hey, actually, we have this budget for about a year. We need to do some historical projects. Are you in? And I said, yes, I am very much in. Um, so curious to know sort of the role that the network and sort of, you know, um, the role your network is playing in, in helping you progress in your career. Uh, 
I mean, in my case, yes, it did help a lot. Now that I'm Manila, I sort of lost all my contacts in Europe and the US because Manila is so far away from everywhere that I basically had to that kind of I, I, I had to restart from scratch. But I do love the idea of reinventing myself. So I take that as a challenge and I, I don't mind. But the way I landed my job in Manila was because uh, due to my achievements with the IOM, we had, an, we had an unspoken sort of budget mandated war between IOM and UNHCR when I was at the UN. And I was constantly sort of in skirmishing with the with the UNHCR social media team, which was 10 times larger than our, and I had a budget that was 100 times larger. But we beat them during during the first two years of COVID. We, we had a lot more content. We, we just did a better job. Uh, part of it was luck, part of it was extra, um, was, you know, the sort of freedom we had from our management. And that landed us on a couple of uh, international awards as a, as a team, which then got my team noticed and the advisor to the principal director of ADB uh, approaching me informally, letting me know that they would open a position within six months. And if I was interested, they would be very happy for me to apply. Of course, I wasn't promised anything. I had to compete and we were like 650 people. Um, but the, the network did help. So I definitely think the people you meet and the achievements you have, uh, yeah, do come in handy in your career. And again, it's a marathon. There are maybe things that we do today that we see the benefits on 10 years from now, 15 years. Career is a long, it's a, it's a long process. And sometimes maybe Jackie will be director of a big agency because of something you did last year. And maybe, you know, Son Young will be, uh, you know, an ordinary uh, full professor at Harvard because of the connections she developed through UC and the other Cold War history. So I think it's all about thinking long term and not being, not being turned off by rejection. I see rejection as great opportunities to improve. And I can guarantee you that we had plenty of rejections in our careers. It was not a linear, a linear journey. I was rejected many times before I landed on the job with Kofi Annan, for instance. And then, so yeah, don't don't be discouraged. So in my case, I mean, in academia in general, the recruitment system is more would be more transparent. And so I got most of my position, previous position through more like public recruitment, uh, recruitment process, which are open to anyone. But also I got probably two positions through personal network, especially if you are interested in more policy oriented job in DC, this kind of think tank, lots of think tank there. Definitely, you know, your personal network would be very useful. Yeah. And even the job currently I have this senior research fellow position at University of Vienna, I got it first through my personal network. Someone I know working here and introduced me to the department, things like that. And then I got this EU grant and then now it's okay, it's more public and official, but any kind of personal network, even in academia is quite important. That's why I told you uh, it's better to start early, even from your first year as a PhD student, and then definitely build up your network in your, you know, subject field. So it, it could be useful later in any case. You know, you if you want to move to another country and then you don't know where to start, you just contact someone you know in that country in academia, and then you can be introduced to you know, all this uh, community, academic community in that country, because I was moving around to many countries. So this kind of network, definitely very useful.
Yeah, and I think I mean to, to add to this, I mean networking. I, I think it's 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 crucial no matter what the field. I know you know in academia, as you said, yes, it's a very small world, academia in the end, and especially when you narrow it down to a specific field, whether it's nuclear history or or something else. You know, if you start early, you will soon, in one way or another, be connected to 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 most uh, most uh, most of the scholars that work, no matter where they are. Um, that, that work in your your field. I mean, it's of course different in different fields a little bit, but it's it's important. I think in terms of also, but, but in terms of the other other fields, I think and in uh, being in Geneva, Geneva in the end has all these opportunities, but it's also very small. So I think that also in turn, I I think what, one of the things that I, you're talking about rejection and and so forth. From what I gather, some discussions with our career services here is that that while most students, for example, do get an internship if they want somewhere, they're not necessarily get going to get the one they really want first. Uh, that that's something they have you're going to have to live it but it, it's uh, it's a, like like Luca was saying it's a process it's not you know it's a kind of a marathon yes but it's also it's not uh, sometimes but hopefully you will never hit the wall as as some runners do but it's it's a it's it's a marathon with uh, with lots of um, drink stops and 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 so fueling stops and 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 so forth um and and not a linear one that necessarily is going to go uh, go just one way the whole time, uh, which again then would connect with the simple fact that today most careers are not careers for for life, right? Um, that most careers have different, and I think you th all three are examples of this. That that you have you you sort of shift gears every so often, and and that's become I think more common than not in in today's world, regardless of what your what your educational background is. Uh, maybe I could I ask, like to ask Se-Jung a, a question about, so you, you were a diplomat for a while, right? Any regrets in terms of, uh, of leaving that world? How does that world look now when you look back to your, your time as a, as a junior diplomat for, for the Republic of Korea? How does it seem now um, from the you know, vantage point of, of Vienna? Uh, a PhD in hand. Uh, to put it simply, I have no regret. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed working for the ministry when I was there. I learned a lot, and then I really grateful for. I was actually the if if the ministry hadn't sent me to this UN this armament fellowship program, I which I joined. When I was uh, working for the ministry, I wouldn't have really have thought of this kind of academic career because during the UN fellowship program, I was really exposed to many different parts of disarmament and non-proliferation issues. And it really, uh, how can I say, kind of made me think like, you know, I want to do more in this field, in this very specific field, instead of at working just a, just a, a diplomat who are like the usually diplomat had this kind of rotation system, moving around the country or moving around each department in the ministry. So I wanted to be a specialist in this field, uh, especially I wanted to be a historian, diplomatic historian. So since I left the ministry, I haven't really regretted my decision yet. <laughs> But when I moved to the Vienna, which is the IAEA located, so this is really the uh, center of nuclear diplomacy, you know, uh, I, even though I'm not a diplomat, I kind of, you know, I'm kind of surrounded by this kind of diplomatic environment, you know, I can meet those diplomats or ambassadors or IAEA officials, I'm going to start working on this IAEA histories. So definitely I will visit their archive, things like that. So still I'm kind of part of his diplomatic community, even though I'm not a diplomat. So in that sense, I'm happy with uh, where I am, what I'm doing as a historian. Still, I think I can contribute to those uh, nuclear diplomacy as a historian for a longer term. Right. 
Thank you. Um, on, are there any, any? Yes, we other? have a question here. Excellent. Is there a question online as well? So, yeah, it's gone already. It's gone? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right, please. So, I have a question. If I were um, thinking about going into a PhD in history today, one of the things that I would be curious about is um, technology, right? Because when we think about history, typically we think about people sitting in dusty libraries who don't know anything about uh, using a computer. Um, <laughs> we know that the employment market is moving more and more, like integrating the use of new technologies. And it's kind of scary and it's kind of exciting at the same time. And I think it's exciting that, um, Jackie, I saw on your somewhere on your background that you had something to do with a metaverse, which I thought was curious. And uh, Luca, certainly you're working in digital media. You certainly know more than I do about technology. And um, so you're also in teaching and academia. So my question is, first of all, how has technology kind of uh, permeated your professional trajectory? And my second question about that, to take it to a slightly deeper level, as historians, right? So you are trained into looking at things in their context contextualizing thing and looking at long, like taking the long view about evolutions. And how do you see new technologies in your professions from that point of view, from the historian's uh, perspective? Thank you. Uh, excellent. Yeah, Jackie, go ahead. Please. I can go first. Um, yeah, I think you know, my area of specialization was the interwar period. <laughs> so, you know, my consumption of technology before was, you know, obviously reading stuff online, you know, your phone, your camera, your laptop, you know, that was about the extent of it. Um, the first role I had at the forum kind of threw me in that straight away. So I worked on a product called Strategic Intelligence, and I'll drop the link after. Um, it's essentially an interconnected visual encyclopedia of many different topics. Um, and the idea there was to, among other things, make sure that the many varied topics that the forum deals with, we've got some sort of public record about what we're talking about. We're integrating experts. So I launched a process to work with think tanks and researchers to co-curate the content. Um, it still exists. I, I, I moved on from the project after about a year and a half, though. Um, so I think there it was a really nice blending of, of worlds, sort of coming from the knowledge world, um, going into something that was a bit more tech forward. But I have to admit, I didn't work on the technology of the product itself. Um, jumping ahead a few years, so I got headhunted internally to be the first full-time employee of the forum's metaverse project, the Global Collaboration Village. Um, that was wild. It was a tech startup within our, our organization. Um, and what I was working on was developing the content. So how were we working with different teams across the house to translate what they were doing, say, in manufacturing or on ocean conservation into immersive virtual experiences that could teach our constituents something? Um, I quite enjoyed it, um, although that being said, after a certain point, I think I got it to where I could take it and I, I wanted to move, which is, which is why I've moved on from that project since. Um, but I see technology as something that's here to stay. I think, um, I can't speak for academia, but at least in the organization I work, it's something that's on our minds every day. We're always experimenting with new paths in that direction. And I think you have to be fluent in order to be um, viable in the job market in that. Doesn't mean you need to come in knowing how to code something necessarily, but you need to have an awareness and an openness to learning and to understanding and asking questions about why something is developed this way, but also bringing your personal experience and your skill set to better improve um, the product that exists. Well, there are lots of specialists now who claim that coding is a useless skill and all those people who spent years learning how to code will just be superseded by people who know how to use prompts and ask the right questions to AI. But and I think that I think technology is here to stay. I'm not necessarily optimistic about the future of the labor market for many ways, not just in terms of automation, but also the lack of critical thinking and the, the fact that we don't really have we, we can't read anymore. Um, the human attention span has decreased from 15 seconds in 2001 to less than 0 0.7 now. 
meaning we can't read a book without looking at our phones for at least five, 50, 60 times every hour. That is a terrible thing that I hope most historians are spared from. Um, in terms of critical thinking, that is what gives you the comparative advantage in technology. Technology doesn't change humans. Humans are this, have been the same. Evolutionary biology will tell you that humans' needs haven't really changed. We are social creatures, social animals, call it the way you want, but we thrive in, in groups and we basically don't thrive when we are by ourselves. So technology is just a different way to, to manifest different extremes of humanity. You can use it in good ways, you can use it in bad ways. So as a historian, you should know that one of my favorite uh, historians has said that once uh, humanity's capacity to make, to make great things made democracy possible, but human capacity to hurt each other like no other species on earth made democracy a necessity. So you know that with, like all things, technology comes with its positive and negative views. It's up to you as an historian to have the sort of long durée of what are the good ways to use it, whether this can be applicable in, in your sphere, in your, in your agenda, in your job market, make the most out of it, keeping in mind that technology is just a tool to help you do the same things that our parents or grandparents did. Communication is the same. It just evolves in different ways that privilege more narcissistic uh, means today rather than a top-down communication when we were just reading newspaper but the needs are the same is to be connected and not to feel lonely so you can draw your conclusions and and technology again is a pandora's box you can learn it unlearn it you can reinvent it you don't need a degree to learn how to use a smartphone or to learn what the metaverse is you need to immerse yourself in the technology and then learn its limitations and, you know, in, a, in a, kind of the same like what you do when you're in an archive, right? You don't know much about the, about why Kissinger said ABC to a certain uh, national security advisor, but then by, by immersing yourself in the archives, you discover the pros and cons of what was going on, the limitations, maybe that the whole question you had was, was wrong in the first place. It's the same with technology. I don't see much difference in that. So it's mostly about how you approach it. But yes, it's here to stay and we should a bit we should be a bit concerned, I think. And That's just me being pessimistic, so don't listen to it. Yeah, so I can just add shortly the in academia, even academia cannot escape from the change of the world. And definitely there are more and more courses at universities which acquire digital kind of humanities skills. So I was in a, at Leiden, I was a part of this uh, humanities faculty. And then even I had to teach a course which is coordinated with digital humanity faculty members. So I had to, you know, even I didn't teach, you know, all this uh, computer skill, whatever, but I kind of designed courses together with those digital humanity people how to kind of educate my students in a more, you know, kind of knowledgeable in this digital humanity ways. You know, they are learning history or politics, but they are able to, they should be able to read those digitalized data and even produce those data. So if you, even though you are a historian, if you are, if you are equipped with some knowledge of those technology, it would be quite useful in an academic job market these days. And there are lots of positions available these days in digital humanities as well. So some of my students, master PhD students, they are kind of trying to learn more about this. And of course, technology itself, it cannot be just a purpose. It could be a means, and there are lots of discussion about it. But learning about it and then applying this to your research you know you cannot lose that much in in this world and even i i will try to uh how can i say use this technology to kind of how can i say make it uh, like a diplomatic documents if i have diplomatic document it used to be like i just collected it copied it i just use it that's all but these days lots of this kind of funding 
organization, they ask applicants to prove how to use this kind of document or data. So definitely I can build some platform, digital platform to uh, kind of share my document digitally. That's one way I can do that as a historian. So there are probably many different ways you can think about regarding this technological development and how you can contribute as a historian. That's great. Maybe I, I could just add <laughs> very briefly that, you know, of course, historians in general, I mean, what we study is, is change and continuity and, and that's it. Um, you know, in its many manifestations, and one of those big manifestations is technology and how it has changed every, how it's changing, has changed and changing, changing everybody's lives as we speak. So, in in that sense, of course, it is very much the focus of um, it is part of a historian's brief is to understand um, how technology changes lives and and so forth. It's also, of course, technology is a tool. For, for all of us, you know, we don't use typewriters anymore, even though we may be historians, so we don't have that kind of nostalgia um, for for the old times. So, so, so that is certainly not the case. And as, as uh, Jung was, was just saying, you know, digital humanities is a huge growing, uh, growing field uh, in, um, in history departments uh, uh, around the world. Um, historians are increasingly interested in big data as everybody is and the uses of big data um, and you know even here at the graduate institute if you go and look at our teaching program you will actually discover that yes we have we will have digital humanities inserted into our, our teaching program we will have a course or a couple of courses that deal with the, the role of information technology how it has transformed lives over the last century not just in you know with with the late last week's talk about artificial intelligence and how it's going to destroy the world. But, you know, we can go back a um, uh, hundred years, 50 years, depending on, on your perspective. And I think the historian is probably better place to understand that transformation and also to understand that it's, there's no end to that transformation. That it's on, an ongoing process. It's not that we suddenly reach the peak of, of human intelligence today and and this is where we are but rather it's an ongoing process with its ups and downs as luca was saying you know people are you know capable of amazing discoveries and and inventions but also capable of of amazing cruelty and and uh, and so forth so we are funny creatures in in in, in that way um anyway I'm, <laughs> this is not going to be one of my lectures so i'm going to stop there um, I wonder if there are other questions either in the in the room or no, it's over. Not at the moment. Okay. How we nobody on the chat. So just to, just to word, uh, you see, we spoke a lot about networking. So uh, as you know, there are the alumni around the world. So we have more than 80 chapters around the world. We'll have uh, a workshop to uh, network in French very soon on the 9th of April. Um, and uh, you will have the alumni reunion on the 14th of September, where you can network with alumni in French or not, but you can you can come, you'll be invited. And just to uh, talk, well, Luca, we have uh, we have a chapter in the Philippines. We have some alumni working there at the ADB. We have someone in human resources who studied here development, which means that we can really do whatever we want with whichever uh, diploma. Uh, we will create very soon a, a group uh, for uh, the World Economic Forum only because we have plenty of alumni over there. And uh, we have a very nice uh, chapter in Vienna, uh, more than 100 people over there. So if you want to join the group, you are welcome. And as you know, you have your patron, your num the number one of uh, AIEI, who is an alumnus who got a PhD in international history. And uh, and so he was a diplomat from Argentina, and so now he's working for an IO. So we can see there that uh, 
everything in the, is in the nature. You see, up to you again. Thank you to all of you, and thank you for being here today. And thank you, Katarina. Great, thank you, thank you, Karen, thank you, Katarina, for 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 putting this uh, this event together. It's uh, it's it's been a great moment. Uh, we taped it all, I think, so we can also then uh, whoever um, missed today can can join and uh, you know listen to all all of the wisdom, uh, a great of uh, uh, all the wisdom that that was shared today. Uh, later on, um, I. Oh, a huge thanks to 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 the three participants, uh, Jackie, Seyung, and Luca. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have your own busy schedules, um, and um, and uh, you know different time zones, especially with Luca. Uh, that that of course it may, it requires a certain uh, extra commitment. So it's it's a great to see you all, even if if virtually. Uh, it's been too long. I hope maybe you, some of you will have a chance to join us in one of these alumni events in person in the in the near future here at the at the Graduate Institute. Um, there was some time normally we would if you were here we would now have a little bit of networking with our our student body here, but I think uh, this is maybe not the right forum uh, for that. However, I I assume that if any of our students in the audience or otherwise wishes to get in touch with you. Uh, for any questions, tips, you know, suggestions, so forth, you are open open to that. So thank you so much again uh, for all this. Thank you all all of you who joined either in person in S five or online. It's been it's been great, and um, yeah, I look forward to our next uh, next meeting to share more uh, success stories such as the three we've heard about today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everybody.